So let's uh, talk about what it'll be like for you to undergo hernia repair. And I'll draw some diagrams and try and put it into context for you so you can understand what we're going to do. A hernia is an abnormal protrusion through the abdominal wall. An inguinal hernia is a protrusion through the inguinal ligament, colloquially referred to as the groin. Let me draw a picture to try and put it into perspective. Seen here is your anterior abdominal wall. Umbilicus at this point, legs in that direction, head up here. The inguinal ligament extends from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. Along the inguinal ligament, the three muscle layers of the anterior abdominal wall attach. The innermost layer is called transversus abdominis and it attaches with transverse muscle fibres to the inguinal ligament. There is, however, a small gap situated about the midpoint of the inguinal ligament, which is referred to as the deep ring. It is through this deep ring that the spermatic cord passes from the inside to the outside. The testicle develops intra-abdominally. At birth, it descends through the deep ring and passes down the inguinal canal to reach the scrotum. The next muscle layer is the internal oblique. It has an arch just medial to the deep ring and its muscle fibres pass in this direction. So as to cover over where the deep ring is. The third muscle layer, the external oblique situated here, has muscle fibres passing in this direction, covering over the defects which lie deeper. The three arches overlap one another, so there is no hole in the interabdominal wall. What happens when you develop an inguinal hernia is that a defect forms along the inguinal ligament. This can be due to an increase in the size of the arches formed by the muscles of the interabdominal wall. Seen here, the deep ring and the next muscle layer, internal oblique, leaving the external oblique in its normal position. And all three arches line up on the medial aspect of the inguinal canal to enable a defect to be formed where a hernia protrudes through. Alternatively, one can tear the muscles on the medial aspect of the inguinal uh, ligament so that there is direct protrusion through the musculature medial to where the deep ring is situated. This is referred to as a direct inguinal hernia. There are two broad approaches to repair of an inguinal hernia. One is either an open repair or a laparoscopic repair. It is usually my preference to try and repair these laparoscopically. To achieve this, it requires an operation. Seen here is the anterior abdominal wall, the hernia situated on the right hand uh, side. To repair this laparoscopically involves the placement of three small ports into the anterior abdominal wall. Firstly, a 10 millimeter incision just beneath the umbilicus, followed by a further two five millimeter incisions in the midline between the umbilicus and the pubic bone. Looking at this from the side, one can consider the abdominal wall as a bucket. It's a muscular bucket which holds the intra-abdominal organs. Seen here is the herniation of the peritoneal sac, the sac which holds all one's bowel, out through the anterior abdominal wall. So from the outside, one sees a protrusion or an area of herniation. In order to fix this laparoscopically, one, needs to reduce the hernia back inside and then bridge the gap where the bowel is protruding through. If you look at you from the side, feet in this direction, head in this angle, the three ports which we have drawn at this point here would be situated at the umbilicus here, which allows for placement of a 10 millimeter optic port. And then here and here, there and there, the two five millimeter ports where the instruments are placed. Once the instruments have been placed and visualization of the space is achieved, it is a matter of reducing the peritoneal sac back inside the abdomen. 
Once that has been um, achieved, a space is formed outside of the peritoneal cavity but beneath the muscle layer. It is in this space whereby you place the mesh to repair the defect in the interabdominal wall. We remove the optic port and then introduce a sheet of mesh which covers over on the inside the defect in the interabdominal wall. Seen from the front, this is situated here, covering over the defect in the interabdominal wall and this mesh measures 15 centimetres by 10 centimetres. It is fixed just to the pubic bone to prevent it from sliding off the hole. There is no other fixative needed. Then the CO2 is removed from the space where we have been operating and at completion one ends up with mesh situated inside the interabdominal wall covering over the defect but outside of the peritoneal cavity. The loops of bowel and all the intra-abdominal organs sit away from where the operative site has been, protected from the mesh by the peritoneum. The reason for developing the plane in the pre-peritoneal space, that is the space seen here outside of the peritoneal sac, but beneath the muscle layer is for two reasons. Firstly, if you were to have a bucket with a hole in it and you wanted to fill that bucket with sand, from a strength point of view, if you placed canvas on the inside of that bucket before you filled the bucket up with sand, the weight of the contents within the bucket push in this direction and so push the repair or the canvas up against the hole. In a similar manner, the repair seen here at completion, whereby the mesh is left on the inside of the abdominal wall, the pressure is always in this direction. So, from a biomechanical point of view, the more one strains, pushes or lifts, the more the mesh pushes up against the anterior abdominal wall. The repair is not dependent upon the adhesion of the mesh to the abdominal musculature. As a result of its position being on the inside, it innately has strength. The second reason for why we develop this plane outside of the peritoneal cavity but beneath the muscle layer is to protect the underlying intra-abdominal contents. If one was merely to bridge the defect with mesh on the inside and not place the mesh outside of the peritoneal cavity, then there is a potential whereby the bowel or intra-abdominal organs can come up against the mesh, cause adhesions, inflammation and problems long term. For this reason, it's imperative that one develops this plane preserving the peritoneum so that at completion seen here, the mesh is left outside of the peritoneal cavity and inside the muscle layer, thereby protecting the bowel from coming into contact with the mesh. The operation usually takes around 45 minutes. Thereafter, you'll be transferred through to the ward and most patients spend about four to six hours on the ward before being discharged home later the same day. I would expect that you'll return back to fairly normal level activity after two to three days. When you are discharged home from the hospital, you'll have three dressings placed on the anteroabdominal wall where the ports were, and these can come down after the third or fourth postoperative day. Beneath these, there are no sutures to have removed. The stereo strips should stay on until they come away on their own. You can shower and bath as you wish. One can resume normal level activity as and when they feel comfortable. There are no restrictions going forward from the time you've completed the operation. As with any operation, there are risks associated with the anaesthetic and the surgical operation itself. With regards to the surgical operation itself, 
In the early post-operative period, the most common complication is that of urinary retention, where one struggles or cannot pass urine. It may require insertion of a urinary catheter for a period of a few days or the commencement on medication. Neuralgic pain or pain as a result of disruption of the nerves can occur in up to 5% of people. It usually resolves over a period of weeks. Testicular pain or swelling can also occur and likewise it tends to resolve over a period of weeks. The most common complication will be that of an infection involving the port sites. This may require antibiotics for a short period of time. Recurrence of the hernia can occur. The rate of recurrence is around about 0.5%. One can also develop a hernia on the contralateral side. That is said to occur in around 20% of people.